If you go back to Arena, it is, it is a procedural dungeon hack. It's a glorious, giant dungeon hack game. And okay, how can we translate that to a phone or a, a mobile device and make it unique to it, right? So I think the input mechanism is really important to those kind of things. While it has all these other parts that we'd want, um, but it really started as you know, a dungeon experience and then Blades grew and grew and grew and grew uh, like everything else, you know, kind of around that nugget. Last year we spent some time at Bethesda Game Studios filming what became four documentaries on their past, present and future. Our doc on the history of BGS charted three decades of development at their headquarters in Maryland. Our doc on the design of Fallout 76 explored how, with the help of a new studio in Austin, they took their first swing at an online-only role-playing experience. Our third doc focused on Fallout Shelter, shone a light on their collaboration with Behaviour Interactive and the eventual creation of Bethesda Montreal. And in this documentary, our final in the series, we explore how that last collaboration has matured as the two studios work together to create their second mobile game, The Elder Scrolls Blades. As we explored in our Fallout Shelter documentary, what was originally planned as a marketing vehicle for Fallout 4 became one of Bethesda's most successful games, so it was almost inevitable that the studio would create a mobile-focused team. And there was also a degree of inevitability about the style of game they'd follow up Shelter with. Not only were the team in Montreal incredibly eager to take a swing at the Elder Scrolls license, but the other mobile game that Todd had wanted to make for years was a first-person dungeon hack. It's been a year since we filmed at the studio, a year in which the design of Blades has changed in many subtle ways. So the game you hear them talking about and the behind the scenes footage you're about to watch may not entirely be accurate to the finished product you play today. But as ever, our focus wasn't on how this game played, how good it was, or what features it has. We wanted to know about the design challenges the project created, and how the teams were attempting to solve them. How veteran leads at the studio in Maryland were collaborating with the francophone mobile development team in Montreal. And the important differences between designing an Elder Scrolls game for the console and for the phone. I think originally Todd had in his mind like he had the vision for what Shelter was. It was very clear. You could show somebody what the, the sort of the origin of what Shelter would be, and it was very clear. And then it was similar with Blades. Like we wanted to make an Elder Scrolls game on your phone, and what would that be? And then if you look at sort of a, a, a screenshot from from Skyrim, sort of you know just you're in a dungeon walking around. You can swing the sword. It's all 3D, as close to console as possible. And Todd came to us, and he was like, "Well, you know." Let's make like a rogue game mixed with like Fruit Ninja kind of thing. And everybody was looking at each other like, okay, how do we do this now? Uh, and make it look awesome. Because like one of the thing about the BGS game is that they have like a super, you know, lush environment with like lots of things. And we did want to bring a similar experience for people on mobile without making it like look like a lot of the 3D game that you see on mobile, like half done. Of course, we all played hack. We all played... Uh, dungeon crawlers and wizardry so way 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 back to those kind of first person experiences but now you can hold this uh, with the touch interface hold your weapon and i think initially the combat for blades was pitched as well what if it's kind of like fruit ninja but more you know strategic and you're actually you know doing maneuvers using spells blocking but you know todd is very very interested in how the sword swings and how that feels when you control it with your fingers, how you touch and release, how all that plays. Because to him, if you can't get that basic part down of the sword moving right, this game's not gonna be any good. And we've spent so much iteration time on how the sword is controlled and how combat feels more than anything else in the game. We weren't sure that the realist look was the right choice. You know, for, for a long time we, you know, iterated on like, do we go more stylized? Do we go more? We weren't sure how far we would be able to push it on the device. Um, but we're lucky every year there's new devices that come out and they're more powerful and more powerful. Um, and I think the generation of device we have now are what we needed to be able, what we want to do. Right away, the more realistic, less stylized art style brought the issue of processing power to the forefront. 
Any video game playing machine has a top limit of CPU and GPU power, but mobile games add a whole new layer of challenge, battery life. Not only are games created to mitigate the effect of your battery draining quickly, but it's also important to not let the handset overheat by creating moments of gameplay that are less processor heavy. And while the team in Montreal were used to these constraints from years of working on mobile games, this was a whole new learning experience for the folks in Maryland. Deciding when and how those elements would affect the design of the game was an interesting challenge. So the group in Montreal who's been working on this, they've worked on phone games for a long time. They have a lot of history there with that. They really know what they're doing. Me as being kind of an outsider to phone games, I'm learning a lot from them. Uh, but everybody's playing the big phone games and saying, oh, how do they do it in this? How do they do it in this? I play tested Shelter and, and helped out the, the guys working on that a little bit, just giving them notes. And But I wasn't in the the day to day, how do you get this to run on a phone? What do you, you know, what's the engine like? What can you use? What can Unity do? How many effects are in it? So there was a big, you know, ramp up time for me to get used to, all right, here's what we do with phones. But we treat it almost as if it's just a regular console game, like any game you'd expect from Bethesda. It's, it's as big as we can possibly make it with as much detail as we can put into it. We actually started with uh, one of the kits we'd used for Skyrim as sort of the base uh, block out for how the game could run, how it would work how it would load levels, and it was more of a tech test. And eventually we polished it up and polished it up and started making it look really, really good. Uh, keep in mind, like, the art we used initially was not even PBR, so we're porting PBR, or changing it over to PBR on a phone, which kind of blew my mind initially that this can run on a phone. So that's how the, kind of the castle initially started. It was more your, here's our classic dungeon experience, the castle, how cool can we make this? And we said, well, you know, we don't want everyone to think this game is just, oh, I'm stuck in dungeons all the time. Let's go outside and how big can we make it? What can it be? Uh, and the artist who started that, uh, Mike, he, he kind of blew us away with like, okay, I've got this kit and here you go. Here's what a big force could be. And we're like, is this gonna run? There's no way this is gonna run on the phone. And then it did. So it was a combination of make it look that good and make it be a, a you know, AAA console game on your phone, but also, play that way as well. Like we didn't want to fill the screen with buttons and controls and it's like how do we make that feel good and feel natural and be an Elder Scrolls experience but on your phone. So yeah we still, it's an ongoing thing as far as features and, and how it looks and then the other issue is performance and battery life and you know, we can make it look crazy and your battery will run out after 20 minutes. Right. Nobody's gonna like that. Uh, these phones, are, um, the latest generation are super powerful but not for a long time. Right. You know they're meant to be used in burst. Um, two things happen when you don't do that, uh, they overeat and they use up a lot of battery. So we have to find ways to pace it. So that's why we're trying to keep, let's say, the quest experience not too long and try to make you move between the different places in the game. So not stay in the town forever, not stay in the quest forever. By doing this, we give the phone a little break and it's able to cool down. Not everybody lives in Canada in the winter, so we have to think of everybody else. But everything that has a battery, uh, you know, you need to be self-aware of like how much power you're draining. And of course, like when you maxed out the CPU and the GPU on the device, there's, you know, I mean, there's only one source of energy on these things. And they can be plugged in, but I don't, you know, it's kind of sad to think that you'll have to plug your phone every time you want to play our game. Right. So, and it's not really good for the phone either. So we don't want to break it. It's more, it's, it's this combination of like, we still want that. We still want it to be Elder Scrolls, which it very much is. You know, there's a, there's a whole story that ties back into the blades, um, to character customization. There's a lot of depth there. I think I guess going back to what we learned from Vault Shelter for this is the ways to make a game that's very simple and accessible, but has the depth that our games are known for. So you can't necessarily go anywhere and do anything. It's a mobile game. You know, we can't put a, the entire Elder Scrolls on your phone. Or at least it's not something we want to do because there's a lot of baggage that comes with that. But the, the feel of an Elder Scrolls game, the customization, the ability to explore, to make the character you want to make for yourself and have an Elder Scrolls story, but at the same time do it in five minute chunks. Right. And make sure it works in that way. And then what is the right amount of time? Like, Because people are going to play for a long time probably. Like We don't want to stop people with timers or, or things like that. But are people going to play, you know, is it fun to sit down at home and play for an hour on my couch? or? I'm you know, in line at the DMV, I have five minutes, and making sure that it works in both those cases. So that's sort of where the challenge comes from, but also the fun. And again, it's also like we do with the, the big games, like what do we want to play? A lot of times, you know, Todd likes to say great games are played, not made. So we sort of play it like what's fun about this, what isn't, what can we do differently?
There's a wide creative playground between a large-scale open-world role-playing game and your standard mobile experience. So the team's goal was to balance the role-playing design of your standard Elder Scrolls game with an experience that could be played in bursts, an important element to both the pattern of mobile players and the constraints of the hardware. You play a blade and you're coming back to your hometown, but something happened, you know, some, some of these like, bandits have taken your town and broken everything around. Um, your town is all destroyed when you get there and you have to slowly, you know, kind of rebuild your town and build up your reputation and visit quests. You help your town being rebuilt by going into different locations uh, that we call dungeons. So, for instance, there's castle, there's another one that's the forest, um, there's another one that's going to be kind of allied, uh, which is like kind of the health, the, the, some of the elf uh, from um, Oblivion. A part of the game is procedural uh, dungeons, like hack, you keep going and going and going until you die. Uh, and that's really a grinding mechanic. You keep hacking, going through dungeons, looting, opening boxes, uh, chests. The, the, the core is, is, is you explore the dungeons, do your quests, so some of them are quest based, there's a narrative and so on, others are just procedural. And as you do that, you gather the resources, you grow a character, those resources you invest in building a town. And once you build your town, you have crafting. And crafting allows you to create unique weaponry and equipment and so on, which allows you to go back into grinding if, if, you, if, you're, if you want. You know, we, we figure out like, okay, what are the, the main kind of adventure areas we want to have in this game and, and how are we going to put them in? How much time do we have to make them? But uh, we early on decided like, we want the town that you're rebuilding to be kind of wherever you think it is. It's not one particular place on a map, which is different for us because usually we start with a map. This game has no map. Um, but we wanted you to sort of put your flavor on the town through customization and naming it and what you thought the town was. And then that allows us to go on an adventure anywhere we want. So we have all these different locations and then you know maybe later we can add anything else we want to this game. Uh, and it's kind of fun that way. It's a little freeing. It's different than how we'd normally do things. Blades was originally supposed to be in beta a few months after E3. The project has been delayed a number of times as the teams have attempted to polish and refine the experience. Some elements of the design, such as the ability to visit other players' towns and a PvP arena mode, have been kicked further down the road while the team focuses on core features. During our time at BGS Rockville, we filmed the studio's monthly meeting where all remote studios dial in to give updates and catch up on the progress of other games an interesting insight into the unique challenges of mobile development. A lot of the single player stuff is going in now, the, the core flow where you can play through the game, you can play some of the quests now, you can do the, you know, the loop of, is this fun to rebuild my town, the combat, that's all going in now. That said, there's still a couple things that are a risk to our schedule, so we started doing strike teams for the specific things that are a problem or just schedule-wise or an issue. One of those is UI, so, so this is a big issue. We're working, to, we just hired a new UI person, we're focused on this. Uh, level design, so we had the ability early on to make random dungeons, but we found when we went to make a lot of the quests, we couldn't really control the dungeons as much as we needed to. There's some tools level, level designers needed, so we've made those tools now, so we're really focused on how long is the level, how does the quest play, what's fun on mobile. You know, people don't want to spend 20 minutes, something we've seen with demos, when you go through the dungeon, if there's too many ways to, to go on a mobile game, it's just it's too much, it, people get lost. So. We're doing a lot of work on level design. This is the key, key focus for us to make sure that this part is fun because it's the core of the game. Hey, what we're trying to do internally for, with uh, Bethesda is location is irrelevant. So if you're working in Montreal, working in Rockville, and even now in Austin, um, where we have strike teams of people that are working in feature across the three locations. Four and a half years later now, we've become pretty good at working cross-location. We're here all the time. The Rockville folks come to Montreal as well. We have more of a mix in Montreal on console. Uh, it's still tech-heavy, uh, the, the roots, but we have art people now also in Montreal that are working on some of the, the 76 uh, pieces and the other games. Overall, the, whole, the company and then the studio both have really, really grown say maybe more corporate, you know, as you get bigger, just things have to sort of get more official. So that, that's happened a lot. It's grown a lot, a lot of other games being published by the company. I think internally it's just the, the number of things we're working on, the number of projects and the number of people and the number of studios. And so that's grown a lot, but the still the sort of core feel of, the, you know, 
the kind of games we make and the, the way we make them is, hasn't changed nearly as much as you would think. It's a really nice thing. It's just more people. So how do you, how do you communicate that properly to more people? And how do you change a feature at the last minute when the people are in another country? Hey, you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, the art uh, presentation is going to be a little quicker today, uh, mostly because we're moving over to Polish, which is a great stage for us. Got a lot of our outsourcing assets in. They're all pretty much done. This is the revival <laughs> scroll. It's the most detailed scroll we've ever done, and you hardly ever see it. <laughs> That's awesome. This is probably the biggest you'll ever see it in your whole life. <laughs> This is an example of polish. You can see at the top, those are the weapons you know, a week ago. And then Manny did a quick material pass. We were having some issues with uh, some of the substance work. And a lot of it was actually the stuff we got from outsourcing. But I don't know if you can see the difference. The old ones are kind of faded and not very saturated. And I, it took him an hour to go through all the weapons. And oh, we fixed it all. So we're doing a lot of that stuff. That's where we're at now, trying to really polish up the game, make everything look great. Uh, this is the statue. Remember I showed the concept for this for like winning the arena? Uh, when I was up in Montreal, I saw this in an earlier state and it had a, a lot of unfortunate intersections. <laughs> it was so awkward that I was like, there's no chance that is going in our game. Uh, it has been fixed. It's more stylized. It's, you know, King of the Hill meets Dante's Inferno, but for a while there it was very questionable. <laughs> Bethesda Game Studios has always overlapped projects, but this new BGS with its distributed collaborative development style is a whole new challenge for both veteran designers and the younger generation. Blades is currently available in early access and much like Fallout 76, is receiving updates based on player feedback and developer insights. Elements of the monetization in Blades have already come under fire from both players and critics, and so changes to the economy and chess timers have already been patched in. So what the Elder Scrolls Blades will look like in another year's time is anyone's guess, but I think one thing is for sure. As far as BGS are concerned, mobile games will continue to be a part of the studio's future. I think more and more people start to figure out like, okay, this is a this is a thing, it doesn't replace what we do now, it, it enhances and complements it. And, you know, it might be its own game, it might tie into the main game. I think the industry is still figuring that out, but it's it's crazy how fast it's happening. I think you look at Fortnite's a good example of, it's the same game on your phone and at home and your progress carries over. And then what makes, it's figuring out what makes sense for the franchise you're working on, the game you're working on. In a way, the same way that Fallout Shelter was uh, a fun experience until the real game was coming up, I think people will see uh, Blade as a a fun experience until the big game comes up. Uh, you said yourself you're a big fan of Skyrim. Yeah. Um, are there some stuff that like you you like needed to have in this game? Dragons. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that that's one thing I needed to have. Uh, one of the things that I'd love to have and we don't have yet is horses. But you know, uh, who knows where this is gonna go once it's live? I think you know, being a first person kind of game, <clears throat> I think the VR experience is just a given. You know, like you see it. Like you, if if you play it, when you play the demo, you see with the the blade and everything, the point of view, the environment. It's, it's, it's gonna be uh, perfect for VR.